Today we are starting, or we're continuing in a series called The Fruit, and we're talking all about the fruit of the Spirit. And so today, as we're continuing in this series, uh, obviously I want to remind us of our key verse, which comes from Galatians 5, verse 22. Uh, by the end of the series, you're going to have all of these memorized in order, so you're welcome for that. Galatians 5, 22 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And as we talk about these things, we're, we're in week number three here. So today we're going to be talking all about peace. We're talking about the peace of God. How do we have the peace of God? How do we um, see that produced in our life? And we've got to remind ourselves, I've talked about this every single week. I probably will continue to talk about it. We can't produce the fruit of the Spirit on our own. We don't produce it. We're not the source of it, but we bear it. We can bear the fruit, but God is the source of the fruit. And so any other fruit of the Spirit, if we see any of those fruits produced in our life outside of abiding in a close relationship with Jesus, then what happens is those are counterfeit versions of the fruit. And so the only way for me to truly have peace, to have God's peace, is if I stay close with him so he can produce it or source it in my life. And I talked about this a little bit earlier, but the opposite of peace is anxiety. And in our world, statistically, anxiety is at an all-time high. Just a few statistics. You can look this up later if you want. But in 2019, 8% of Americans reported symptoms of anxiety. 2019, that was 8%. In the last year, or two years rather, that number rose to over 40%, from 8 to 40. Now, obviously, a lot happened between 2019 and now in our world, but amazing to see anxiety go through the roof. In fact, some would even say, some studies show that over 75% of all doctor visits are anxiety-related issues, that it can be linked back to something in my life, anxiety that is causing something else to go haywire. I don't know if you know that, but a lot of times that can happen in our life where I have, I'm carrying around some stress and what it will do to my body, it may not show up in the form of um, feeling stressed. It may show up in, in the form of something else in my body going wrong. And they said over 75% of all doctor's visits are anxiety-related issues. But here's the good news today. Our God is the God of peace. Our God is the God of peace. In fact, it's one of his names, Jehovah Shalom, which is the Lord is peace or the God of peace. It's one of his names. And we say this quite a bit here. I like to say this uh, quite often. There's a lot of names of God in, in, in our Bible. He doesn't want you just to know his names. He wants you to experience his names. That's how intimate of a God he is with you. He wants a personal relationship with you so much so that you don't just know about him, know his names, you experience his names. And in fact, we did a series on that several years ago about the names of God, and it's a fascinating study to think God wants me to experience all of his names in my life. He wants you to have peace. God's peace, his peace supply is not in short supply. God's peace supply is not in short supply, and his desire is to give it to you. So, Here's what we have to understand. God's peace is not just something that floats down on its own out of heaven and mysteriously shows up in our lives. That's not how it works. It doesn't just randomly show up. It doesn't just mysteriously show up um, whenever, whenever God wants it to. It's, it, what's amazing is it's much more substantial than that. It's not a random feeling every now and then. No, it's much more intimate than that. And I'm going to show you today. Point number one, if you're taking notes, is this. The peace of God is defensive. It's the first fill in the blank. The peace of God is defensive. It's defensive. When we talk about being defensive, we're talking about guarding something. We're talking about protecting something of value. And we're going to see this in Scripture. It's one of the most popular verses when it comes to having or experiencing the peace of God. The peace of God is defensive. So I'm going to wait. I see Gavin's still filling out his notes. So all right, he's done. That's good. All right, the peace of God is defensive. Philippians 4 says this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So a couple things to note here. This is a very popular verse but let's, let's break it down here really quickly. God's peace surpasses understanding. Here's what that means. There's going to be moments where you're going to be in a crisis situation. There's going to be an emergency going on, or maybe, maybe you, you just lost your job, or there's something going on, and it is like everything in you. And what the world would say is this is the, the proper time to freak out, right? If there's every time to freak out, now is the time. But there's going to be an inner peace in you that says, I know I should be panicking, but I don't need to. I don't have to. This happened to me um, 
This is a piece that surpasses all understanding. This happened to me about a year, maybe a little over a year ago. Uh, my truck was having some issues, and basically every shop that I took it to, they said, well, you're just going to have to put in a new motor. So like, well, what are we talking here? 7,500 bucks? They didn't put in, I, that's more than what I paid for my truck, y'all, okay? Like, hey, hey, it's just, you know, it, it, to do all this, we, there's several other options, but it's going to be thousands of dollars to fix. Well, we started doing a little bit of research, and we found out that we could attempt to fix it on our own. How I many know that's a little bit of a dangerous game to play? You know what I'm saying? But as we looked into it, and as I talked to more people who had done this, this thing that I was going to do to my truck, they had done it before. We had peace, and I prayed about it, and I was like, Lord, I don't want to go in here and mess things up even more. I need peace if we're going to walk this thing out. And so here's what we did. We bought a $200 kit off of Amazon. I paid about another $200 in some random tools that I didn't have, and for less than $500, my truck was fixed and up and running, and uh, they wanted me to spend $7,500. I made some phone calls. To, you know, I just want you to know that to the people that told me that I was going to need to pay for a new motor. I was like, uh, hey, just so you know, an amateur fixed my truck for less than 500 bucks. But anyway, that's besides the point. But here's what happened. When I got that news about my truck, everything in my flesh wanted to be discouraged, wanted to be stressed, wanted to say, how is this going to work out? But there was a piece in me that said, I don't know, but I know God does. I don't know, but I know his word is true. I don't know, but I know that we tithe, and he says that he's going to bless our hand, everything we put our hand to. I don't know, but he says he's going to supply all my needs. I don't have the answer, but I have the peace that I know that something is going to work in my favor. And so I had to walk it out. And so that's the peace that surpasses all understanding, because the world will look at you and say, you're crazy. How are you not stressed out right now? How are you not um, pulling your hair out right now? What's What's going on with your life? And you say, I don't know, except I know Jesus. And I'm close with him, and his peace rules in my heart. He is the prince of peace. But let's look at the next word that I really want to look at is guard. The guard in, uh, that word guard in the original Greek means this, to protect by a military guard, or even better, look at this, to prevent hostile invasion. So what does the peace of God say? It says when you, when you do these things, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds as you live. So what God is literally doing is he's putting up bodyguards, if you want to look at it that way. What does a bodyguard do? A bodyguard protects uh, people of authority, right? Our president, our governor, uh, I mean, uh, Division I football coaches, right? Like we have, they have bodyguards nowadays. Like um, more important, I guess another way of saying it is important people. Bodyguards protect important people. And what I love about God's word, how it says that he wants, his peace wants to guard your heart and your mind, is it reveals God's thoughts towards us. He sees you and your heart and your mind as important. Important enough to assign bodyguards to your heart and to your mind. He says, I see you. I put that kind of value on you, that you need to be protected, and I'm going to do it. So what are God's spiritual bodyguards? It's simply this. The spiritual bodyguards that God gives us are his promises in his word and his truths in his word. These things are, they're spiritual soldiers, they're spiritual bodyguards that keep me at rest. It keeps me there. And when I think and when I dwell, when I, when I meditate and I study God's word and his promises, it's like I'm allowing these spiritual soldiers to come into my life, into my spirit, into my mind, and to set up a guard against things that would cause anxiety and stress to overtake me. I'm saying, Lord, I know your word. And your word says this, I'm going to believe that even though my flesh says to believe the worst in this situation. This is why in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take every thought captive. Well, how can I do that? The the scripture um, more accurately translated in the original language is to take captive with a spear to the back. That's how it actually should be translated into English, to take captive with a spear to the back. It's much more aggressive than just thinking, well, I shouldn't take, I shouldn't think about that. I need to think about something else. No, it's much more of a military mindset to say, this is a trespasser. This is a hostile invasion. Think of what guard meant. I, no, we need to get rid of, stop it in its tracks and get rid of this thought coming in here that does not belong, does not align with God's word. But I cannot take every thought captive if... I don't know God's thoughts. That's the only way that I can be like, how, how can I take every single thought? You know how many thoughts I have every day? Random thoughts, right? Like, how do I take every thought captive? I must know this. It doesn't mean I have to be a scholar, but it does mean I need to have some things memorized, and I need to know his word, and I need to be in his word every single day. His thoughts 
are his word. How can I have God's thoughts? It's right here. These are God's thoughts. His Holy Spirit breathed them onto paper so that you could have them today. So how can, I, how can I know what God is thinking towards me? It's right here. How can I know God's will for my life? It's right here. It's all right here. If we would just abandon these other books that make us feel good and give us Band-Aids, this is the cure to what we have going on in our life. This book is alive and active. No other book is alive and active. You can get stuff from other books. I'm not saying that. There's a lot of great authors out there and pastors and things that have written spiritual books that are fantastic. However, the most important book that you have at your house and on your phone, on the app, is this one. This is the one that is alive and active. This one right here. Isaiah 26, 3 says this. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Another great insight into God's desire for you. He doesn't just want you to have peace. He wants you to keep peace. He wants you to have it, and he's going to sustain you in it. It's not a momentary thing. Well, you can have it when things are good. You can have it whenever it mysteriously shows up in your life. That's not it. He says, I want you to uh, have it and keep it. You will keep in perfect peace. I live my life in perfect peace when my thoughts are fixed on Jesus. Second Thessalonians 3.16 says this, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and at every occasion. At all times and at every occasion. Here's what biblical peace looks like. Biblical peace is when there is a calmness on the inside of me, even when there is chaos happening on the outside. There's a calmness on the inside when there's chaos on the outside. When we run to Jesus, when we abide in him, when we stay close with him, when we pray, when we worship, we are opening the door for God to put a guard in place to protect our hearts and our minds from anxious things. It is The peace of God is defensive. And that's what I want you to see today is that it's not a passive thing. It's not, a, it's, not a, uh, it's not a sissy thing. It is something that is defensive on your behalf because God knows how important it is for you to win the battle up here every day. That's why he says daily renew your mind. You've got to win this battle. Take every thought captive. Daily renew this thing. Your spirit, your spirit is made brand new at salvation, but your mind must be made new every single day. That's why it's renew. I'm renewing this thing. This thing must be made new every single day. And so this is why a little bit earlier, that's what we talked about. He says, if you've got to win this battle, and I'm going to equip you with guards to win this battle. That's why earlier, even just talking about that study in 2004, saying that our bodies work this way, where anxiety and gratefulness cannot coexist. God says, I'm going to give you the answer to these things. It's found right in, in my word. Point number two is this. So the first is that it's defensive. The second fill in the blank is this. The peace of God is offensive. Sorry, it's spelled the same way as offensive, so i got to stress it in how I say it. Offensive. It's on the offense, okay? <laughs> That's a better way of saying it. Could have worded it a little differently. Defensive as well as offensive. It's something that doesn't just block and guard. It is something that goes on the attack for us as well. And so let's look at this. In Ephesians 6, verse 13, we see spiritual armor that we need to put on every single day. And as we go in, we see this list right here. It says this, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may, may be able to withstand the evil in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Come on. That's why I love the New King James. Shod your feet. Come on now. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How many of you know footwear is crucial? Right? Like, if you've played any sports, if you've played football, cleats are a good thing. But if I take those cleats into the basketball court, I'm going to have some issues. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's not going to go well for me. The right footwear is important. If I'm going to go hiking, if I'm going to go mountain climbing, i got to have the right footwear. If I'm going to be working on my feet all day, my work boots better be the right kind of work boots. Otherwise, when I'm done for the day, I'm going to be spent and I'm going to be struggling. Footwear is vital. And Paul is writing here about the armor of God, and he's comparing it to the Roman soldier's armor, because it was the most familiar thing to everyone in the culture today. And it was the most familiar because they were everywhere. They constantly saw the Roman soldier's armor. And so he's comparing it to them. And here's what he says. He says, shod your feet, meaning bind them on. Bind on these shoes that you're putting on. 
he's not talking about loose fitting. He's not talking about sandals. He's not talking about flip flops, y'all. That's not what he's talking about when it comes to the Roman soldier's armor. He's, the shoes of the Roman soldier were warrior shoes. They were warrior shoes. They were not passive, leisure shoes. They were not house slippers, okay? They were used for protection. They were used for grip because they actually had spikes on the bottom. And those spikes were also used for stomping their enemy. So literally, they would go in and they would attack. And as they were taking, if there were people that were wounded, their enemy, they would literally take these cleats and they would stomp on their enemy continually as they would take ground. See, when we think of peace, we think of house slippers. Peaceful day at home, right? Get my, get my slippies on, get my coffee, watch a good movie. That's not biblical peace. Biblical peace is shod your feet, bind up your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Once again, these shoes were for stomping their spiritual enemy. Protection, yes. Grip, yes. But more so, it was an advantage over their enemy that they could literally stomp on them as they took ground for their, for their empire. Again, the peace of God is, is not achieved by passive means. It's not achieved by passive means. It doesn't just float down. It's not just peace, you know, no, no, uh, no violence. No, it's going to take some spiritual violence to see peace in our lives. In order to have peace, the peace of God, there will be a fight. But here's what, here's what I would say. This is why it's important for you to find the right church that God is calling you to. And if, if you haven't found it yet, I pray that you find it. Prayfully consider, God, where do you want us to be planted? Not just to attend. Where do you want us to be planted at, actively engaged in? The reason why is this, because we face a spiritual enemy. And uh, there's, there are, I say it this way, we don't find a church. God calls us to a church. Because God knows your giftings. He knows what you're capable of. And he knows that your gifting and your talent and the things he's putting inside of you go perfectly with a body somewhere locally that you can get under and submit to and be in and be active. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work together. You're going to benefit. It's going to be a win-win. But also, I would say this. We must be careful. In our modern age, there are several churches that are treating church like a cruise ship when we're called to be a battleship. And so they may be preaching the gospel, but the kind of gospel that they're preaching is flip-flops for vacation when scriptural, biblical, peace, gospel that they should be preaching is some cleats for stomping the devil and his demons. That's a big difference between the two. And so I've got to search my heart and ask God, Lord, is this where you want me planted? Is this where I need to be? Because there's too much at stake. Your life, your family, your family tree, your legacy, it is at stake where I am planted and where I put my kids and where they are planted as well. We've got to make sure that we're handing out the right gospel. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Not a passive thing. It's actually a very violent thing, not in the natural world, in the spiritual world. Look at Romans 16, 20. It talks about this exact thing. You're going to see this picture. It's not just a one-off thing. Here we see it. Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Why? Because you're wearing the armor. You have the spiritual shoes on like a Roman soldier would so that you can crush your enemy, the God of peace. It doesn't say the God of war, the God of violence, the God of peace. God's peace is on the offense. It is something that works to take ground for the kingdom. Matthew 5, 9, Jesus said, God, God blesses those who work for peace, or blessed are the peacemakers. What does it mean to work for peace? Sometimes it takes an act of violence to bring peace to a situation. Talk to our military. Talk to a first responder. Talk to our law enforcement. Sometimes they show up to a crisis situation, and the only way to bring peace is to be violent with the one that is causing harm or causing an issue. And with that violence comes what? Peace and freedom for the people that they were oppressing. This is what it shows us. God blesses those who work for peace. So how do we do it? How do we take God's peace that he's producing in our life, and how do we make it go on the offense for us? It's really pretty simple. Uh, Proverbs 18.21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, 
and those who love it will eat its fruit. What am I speaking? You see, when it comes to defending, defending my mind, what we saw in the first point is this. I need to know God's word. I need to study God's word. When I know his promises, no matter what I hear here, I can know his promises in here, and I can say I can have peace because this stresses me out what I just heard, what a report I just got, that call I just got. But in here, I know what is true and what God says he will do in my situation. Studying gives me the defense, but speaking puts it on the offense. Speaking changes it, and it puts life or death into the situation. And sometimes peace will only come when I'm speaking God's word, and it will drift immediately right afterwards. Have you ever been in a situation? I know I have. I've been stressed. I've been in a fearful situation where the only verse that, verse that I had, fear, the spirit of fear was attacking me. I had so much fear, and all I could say was, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. When I said that verse out loud so I could hear myself, I had peace. As soon as I stopped, anxiety and fear, right back. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Right back. What's happening? You have to realize we are in a spiritual fight. If you're a believer, you have a target on your back from a spiritual enemy. He hates your guts. He hates your kids. He hates your family. He, he wants to do everything he can to cause destruction in your life. But we've got to get to a point where we don't just say, well, I'm just, uh, we're not speaking in denial or living in some false reality. No, what we're doing is I'm doing what God's word said, and I'm going to say, I'm going to speak life into this situation. We're in a fight. If you watch anyone fight, what happens? They're exchanging punches. Sometimes I, I punch. I'm active. I'm striking when I'm speaking. But when I stop, what happens is many times I'm standing there, and the devil ain't going to stop just because I stopped. He's going to continue to punch. He's going to continue to kick while I'm down. He's going to continue to do everything he can until I eventually give up and I say, I'm done. So I've got to make a decision to, number one, know God's word, study it. That's defense. But then put it on the offense and say, I'm going to begin to speak God's word in situations, not in denial, but in faith, believing that God's word is true, that I can speak life and I will eat its fruit. I will eat the fruit of life in my situation. The peace of God doesn't just mysteriously fall on us. That's what I'm showing you today. It doesn't just show up and, man, I just feel so peaceful today. Just peace, everybody. You know, no, no, it's actually something that we've got to do something for. It's shod your feet with the gospel of peace. That means go to war for your peace. It's the armor of God. Go to war for your peace. So studying God's word gives me defense. Speaking God's word puts me on the offense for God's peace to go to work. And point number three is this. Reminding us of the source. Abide in the prince of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. Abide in the Prince of Peace. I've got to choose to stay connected. In order for me to even hope that God's peace, his bodyguards are going to show up, for, for me to even hope that I'm going to have peace in the situation, I've got to stay close with him. I've got to be close with him. I've got to be connected with him every single day. Colossians 3.15 says this, And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Let interesting verbiage. What does that mean? Let the peace shows that we have a part to play. It is not going to fall on my lap. You can choose. Let the peace of God that comes from Christ rule in your heart. Here's what this shows me. The peace of God doesn't require perfect circumstances, meaning this, everything's good in my life, like we're all healthy, the bills are paid, I can have peace. It doesn't require perfect circumstances, but here's what it does. It does require faith-based action on your part. Faith-based action. Not to earn my salvation or earn peace. That's not it. But I'm doing my part to let the peace of God rule in my life. I'm doing my part. And here's what it's like. We've got to create habits of renewing our mind in God's word every single day. In doing so, we begin to abide in him. When I'm in his word, when I'm, when I'm reading the scripture a day, when I'm, when I'm studying, when I'm spending time in prayer, when I'm sitting in his presence, when I'm doing that, I'm abiding in him and his fruit is more easily produced and visible in my life. Here's a great example of that is if you ever started to, to choose to, I'm going to get up early and I'm going to go to the gym or I'm going to work out. I'm going to get up early and I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to read my Bible. And you make a commitment to it. You have somebody holding you accountable. I started doing this a few weeks ago where I was going to the gym early in the morning. And the first day, it was awful. All right, I get there. I'm so tired. It's like it's 5.45, 6 a.m. I don't want to be here. I have no strength. This is the worst. 
Second day, a little better. Third day, it was the worst again. Fourth day, a little better. But the next week, it was a little easier. And the third week, my body was getting up by itself. I'd wake up a few minutes before my alarm. I'm ready to go. What was I doing? I trained my body to do what I wanted it to do. My flesh wasn't controlling me. This is what we do in the spiritual. When I choose to make a habit of getting in God's word and speaking God's word on every situation and in every single day times, what I'm doing is I'm setting up and I'm training my spirit that no matter what happens around me, my spirit knows what to do. I know what to do. I'm abiding in him. His fruit is more easily produced. Just like it's easier for me to wake up at 5.30, 5 a.m. because I've been doing it for a while, it's the same way with studying and speaking scripture. The more I do it, the easier it becomes for me. It's the same way with if you've ever tried to, you know, be really good and eat healthy. First week, it's the worst. But eventually, the more I do it, that's what I crave. Give me the real stuff. Don't give me the process. Give me the real stuff. My body wants that. That's the same with our spirit. The more that I feed it, the more that I know what to do. And so when we face difficult situations, your spirit begins to override the emotions you feel in your flesh. And it brings peace to your flesh, to your soul, to your spirit. So the question is, if I'm not experiencing peace in my life, my first question in response to that is, how is your abiding? How's your daily time with God? Do you give, is it rushed? Do you give him five minutes? Is it just, um, you know, I'm, getting ready, I'm on my way to work and I'm distracted by life? How's your abiding? How's your worship? Are you in God's word? Are you speaking God's word? Those things, as basic and elementary as they are, change lives. God knows his kids are simple people. We're simple-minded. He didn't make this thing complicated. He said, I'm gonna equip you. Do the little things well and you're gonna see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Last verse, John 16, verse 33. Jesus said, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I've overcome the world. This is an encouraging verse, but also an eye-opening verse. Here on earth, you might have trials. Here on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Meaning this, we're reminded, we're in a fight. There's a lot at stake, more than we know. There's a lot going on. But when we do our part and what God's asked us to do, we set up, allow those spiritual bodyguards to come in to protect our hearts and our mind. When we get on the offense and we begin to speak God's word in stressful and anxiety situations, we can take ground for the kingdom and we're protected defensively and offensively. We have both. So the peace of God, it's extensive. It's more substantial than we can even imagine. It's not just something that shows up. Well, I feel peaceful today. That's great if you do, but there's more to it than just feeling peaceful once in a while. There's more to it than just putting your house slippies on and watching a good movie, okay? There's a lot more to it than that. The peace of God is defensive. When I remind myself of God's promises, the peace of God comes and it guards my heart and my mind. The peace of God is offensive. Remember, it says, shod your feet with the gospel of peace. What do shoes allow me to do? Go where God needs me to go. Stand when he needs me to stand and stomp the devil whenever he tries to come against me. That's what shoes allow me to do. My spiritual shoes, that's what they allow me to do and abide in the Prince of Peace. The peace of God doesn't require perfect circumstances, but it does require faith-based action on your part. And sometimes that faith-based action is as simple as getting in this book every single day. By faith, Lord, I'm gonna get up early. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to because I wanna be with you so that if I face something tough today, I'm gonna have peace. I can't produce peace myself. He can source it so I can bear it though. And that's the difference. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. And we thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for your word. 
Thank you for giving us a guidebook. Thank you for giving us the truth, the unchanging truth. Thank you for giving us a book that is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray, Lord, that today the word that we studied, the word that we read, that it would go deep into our hearts, that it would go to work in us, Lord, to cut out anything that doesn't need to be there, to produce your fruit in our lives, Lord. We choose to be a people that pursue you, Jesus. We abide in you. We remain close to you so that, Lord, you can produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Lord, I pray that this week would be a peaceful week. As we study your word, Lord, would you give us guards for our hearts and our minds. As we, as we speak your word, Lord, as we memorize scripture and as we begin to speak it, would you help us go on the offense and stomp our spiritual enemy with our shoes as we go to work for your kingdom and we take ground for your kingdom, for our families, in our workplaces, Lord, in our lives as we take ground, would you go with us? Would give us the strength and the spiritual shoes to do what you need us to do. And Lord, most importantly, we're gonna choose and be committed to abiding in you, remaining close with you throughout our day, not just one time in the morning, throughout our day, we're gonna acknowledge you, keep you first in everything we do. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen.